If you have your Bibles, this is a Bible study. Uh, uh, that's the idea here is the Bible study. This is, this is not a uh, performance. Uh, uh, open them to Psalms 11. Psalms 11. Many of you who have known me have heard me teach this psalm. And I've been thinking about what I was going to talk about, what I was going to teach here. I consider this talk, this lecture, this Bible teaching uh, this morning to represent the most serious uh, call that I can make in terms of being relevant to our nation problems. Last night I was often greatly encouraged that we, the church, the people here, could be on the cutting edge of a very serious social problem of today. And that's how we deal with our Latin American neighbors, in particular that 11 million that are here in this country, that we could be God's people on the side of, you could say the oppressed, but what I'm afraid of, that we are so political divisive and that we have accepted hate and against as a way of life that we could end up creating our own terrorists in our own country if we're so mean and so harsh on the immigrants of this country. Because this country within its constitution, its declaration of independence was to be on a nation from all nations under God with liberty and justice for all. We was gonna make a new reality in this country. We wasn't gonna name this nation after our nationalities like most other countries do. We was gonna name our nation, the creed of our nation was gonna be one nation from all nations under God with liberty and justice for all. That sounds to me like the kingdom of God. And our founding fathers had that as a goal. And just at the moment when we can almost make that a reality, when we are overcoming this historical separation and racism because there's a new generation of young people, black, white, all races, coming together who are not concerned about just ethnic races, but concern about all the people, the human race. And in the midst of this, we are trying to make 11 million terrorists at one time because these young Hispanics who are coming to this country are going to our universities and colleges. They are not going to accept the kind of discrimination and persecution as a people that we was able to accept in the past. So we ought to be coming up with ways and ideas to integrate all of our people, especially those in this nation right now. I felt good last night that we took whatever the enthusiasm that y'all brought here and the excitement that you brought here, I won't call it popularity because popularity is too thin and I don't want to build nothing on popularity. We want to build something on the truth and reality that we was able to take that last night and say, we're going to stand with these young people from Latin America who are in this country, who are providing the food and the work and created labor. We want to support that. Okay, I, we, a nation without a border don't have a border. 
So I don't care how secure they make the borders. But I'm concerned about those people that are here that we don't criminalize them. We don't need that. We got enough criminals. Yesterday, and you read the newspaper, to this morning, hear the news. Kids going back to school for the first time is killing each other on the streets. Crime and violence in our society. We got enough of that. So, last night was a wonderful evening. And to think of this young, mixed up Pentecostal uh, <laughs> Baptist girl. Uh, and, 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 and I had a privilege of, 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 of talking to her as we worked in our yard together and that she was able to take that sharp mind and give that mind to God. And last night spoke truth to our heart and uh, it was glorious. It was glorious. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. And so this morning, I'm going to give the most serious message that I can give. So open your Bibles to Psalms 11. Psalms 11. All of you should get this tape and take it home with you when you, when you leave here and uh, pass it on to other people. Psalms 11. Everybody there? In the Lord, I put my trust. How can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the weak had been their bows. They set their arrows against the strain to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. This is our theme. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked and those who love violence, his soul hates. On the wicked he shall reign fiery coals, and a burning supper. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright shall see his face. The theme of my talk this morning is this. When the foundation is being destroyed, Jesus told us, the wise person builds his house up on a rock. A solid foundation. When the foundation of a society is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? That's my talk this morning. What can the righteous do? What can CCDA do? What can Christ's body incarnated here on earth in human flesh, what can we do? You know that is the church. The church is the continuation or the replacement of Jesus Christ here on earth. We are his body. As he was, so we are to be here on earth. That's what Pentecost was about. It was about God, the resurrected Savior, sending the Holy Spirit to live in us. The church was born, and we're to continue his work and his life. His life would be in us. The Holy Spirit would be present so we could know that we belong to him. It's the assurance, it's the down payment that we're going to do his will here on earth and he's going to make a place for us in heaven. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's to lead us and to guide us into truth and to make Jesus Christ real in our life. 
and to help us to interpret the Word of God and help us to listen, listen to God as He speaks to us here on earth. When the foundation has been destroyed, what can the righteous do? First of all, then, we need to know what is the foundation of society. That's important, isn't it? That's our theme. When the foundation is being destroyed, what is the foundation as it's revealed in the Bible of our society? The foundation of our society is the family and the community in which we live. It's the family. It's the family. The family is the model of God on earth. The family. What is being destroyed? What is being destroyed? The family and the community. He created us to live in a community, in a beautiful place. We call it the Garden of Eden. That was to be the way that life was to be nurtured. Life came from God. The Bible says, and God blew into man's breath, nostrils, the breath of life, and we as human beings became living souls. Life belonged to God. And he, the light, John tries to say that in his gospel. When you talk about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, the Word, and without Him not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and this life was the light of humanity to come into the world. And so life is absolutely precious. My problem with the life issue, pro-life and abortion and all of that, they are not pro-life enough for me. It's not, you know, they're not part of, they are pro-life before life get here, but they don't care for life once it's get here. Life belongs to God all the time. All the time. That's what we have from God. And he uses the family to perpetuate that life. What are the biggest issues in life today? The biggest issue has to do with our responsibility in transferring life. What is the biggest issue? And in my community, 72% of the life is being transferred without a father in the home to nurture those children. 72% of all the children in my neighborhood is born out of wedlock. 85% of the children is being raised without that intact family. And so the family was there to enhance and to nurture life so life can have its best chance. If you read the scripture carefully, you'll find when God is fixing to bring a special representative into the world to do something special for him, he usually start with the family before the child is born. You look at all the great prophets they come into the world. They go to, and usually it goes to a mother who can't have a child. What he's trying to do is make that family want this child and desire it so they can take care of that child. They said a child born in a, in a hospital and with some kind of sickness, and if that child, if somebody don't come every day and take that child up in their arm, that child will not function well in life. And God created the family as a loving, nurturing environment for children to have the best chance in life. And somebody said that they now look at how many children were born out of wedlock, how many divorces, and they determine how many prisons they need to build. And in my community, I can tell you, I can look at the people who are going to die, be killed. And in every year, in fact, almost in many cities, we lost four 
thousand people in Iraq, we will lose that many people in the ghettos of America every week. And most of this will be our children who was born out of wedlock who make their way to the prison. And the next highest population of people in prison is those who have gone to prison, whose father's in prison. Their children follow them. We are in serious, serious trouble. The foundation of our society is being destroyed. But I want to talk about a problem that's bigger than that, which would be the solution is the community. Man was created to live in relationship with each other and with the love. The highest commandment is a community commandment. It's to love your neighbor, you love yourself. That's a community commandment in life. And so the foundation, which is the family and the community, is being broke. That's why we call this association here the Christian Community Development of People Association on earth. So we know the problem, don't we? But God got a solution. He says when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now we got the problem, don't we? Y'all got the problem. If we are not dealing with that family, and if we are not dealing with the neighborhood and community, we are missing the commandment of God, and we are not at the problem. We are only dealing with symptoms. We are only taking Tylenol for cancer. I love Tylenol. I think it's one of the best medicines that's ever been made. <laughs> but Tylenol won't fix cancer. And that's what we are doing in our society. We're trying to fix cancer with Tylenol. So the foundation. But who are the righteous? He's pushing the responsibility here. God is thinking to give some people responsible for being salt and light in his world. And they are called the righteous. So the question then, when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, let me tell you who are the righteous. The righteous is not the self-righteous. <laughs> the righteous are those that recognize the fact that self is in the way. And they turn their self over to Jesus Christ. And then Jesus Christ then become our righteousness. God has made Jesus Christ to be our righteousness. And all the righteousness we have ought to be that righteousness that comes from God through Jesus Christ. God has made Jesus to be our righteousness, and he calls us to be the righteousness of God here on earth. Who are the righteous? The righteous in the Bible is the prodigal son. That's the righteous person in the Bible. The prodigal son is the guy who recognized the fact when he was in a pig pen that he didn't have any righteousness. But back home, his father that represented God had what it took for him to have righteousness. And so he left that pig pen. He came to himself. And coming to himself, recognized that he was lost. Lost. Have you recognized you were lost? You are not a righteous person if you haven't recognized your laws. And if you're doing all this good social work, it's like filthy rags if it's not done out of the righteousness of God. We are all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned each one to our own way. But God has laid upon Jesus Christ his righteousness, and he makes you and I righteous when we come back home to God. He puts on us the robe of righteousness, and he gives us the responsibility for running the place, running the place. So the prodigal son is the rights of God. So we know the righteous, the righteous of all of you in here who have turned your life over to Jesus Christ, 
who recognized that you could not handle it well, that you was in the pig pen, and you got up, and you came back to God, and he put on you the robe of righteousness, and he gave you the ring of responsibility, and now you are to be his righteous people. We are God's, we are Christ's replacement here on earth. We have no body but our body. He has placed this treasure of his love and his righteousness in this human flesh so that the excellence of it may be of God and not of us, that we are living out his life here on earth. Being a Christian is the living out of Christ's life. It is the outliving of the in-living Christ. It is making Christ real to the neighborhood and the community. So we know the righteousness then he put, get a responsibility to you and me. He says, what can we do? I'm gonna suggest some things we can do this morning. And I'm gonna ask all of you in this building to join with me in doing this. I'm gonna give you some spiritual things to do. I'm gonna give you some physical things to do. So it's gonna be in word and in deed this morning. We're gonna all join in doing something about the foundation of our society that is broke. Let me suggest then what we can do. Five things to start with that we can do. The sixth one is gonna be the, might be, is just as equally important. So I'm gonna make all of these equally important. And I'm gonna make you, you live when God is giving about, talking about solution to problem, he usually gives you a combination of things to do. God's virtue and character is not one act. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's these things would you do. And if you leave out one of those, you've left out. Because there's one fruit, not many fruit. There's not seven fruits of the Spirit. There is seven actions that we need to take that constitute the fruit of the Spirit. And all of those taken together, if you leave one out, you don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Seven virtues that make up the fruit of the Spirit. A more, a more. I think seven is a term in letting you understand that something is complete, is complete. So what can we do? Number one, we got to come back to truth. Truth is the foundation of society. The throne, the foundation of God's throne is truth and justice. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If you start out with too much error, you won't get there. You must lay your foundation on truth. And what can truth be found at? In the word of God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. God talks about the word as the very action of all creation. The Bible says by faith the world is held together by the word of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Where do you find truth at? That's where Islam has got a, on the hold on us. When I'm hearing people talking about Truth in the Bible, I mean, truth in the society, mostly it's what somebody else said about what somebody else said about what truth is. <laughs> truth comes from God. That's the foundation of life. What can you find truth at? In the Word of God. In the Word of God. It's the basis for truth. So first thing we've got to do is return to the Word of God. The word of, when you turn to the Word of God, you will find faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Where are you going to find faith at? You find it in the Word of God. Faith is in what God has said is true, and that He will fulfill it. And so we've got to go back to the Word of God. 
It's got to stop being folklore. It's got to be, stop being what somebody else said. Let's say what God said. What God said. What God said. That's number one. That's what we can do. That's becoming my passion. That's what I'm going to do with the remainder of my life. The remainder of my life is going to be trying to circumvent the media to get truth into the lives and into the families of these children that we are trying to raise today because the media and the iPod and the phone has circum and the television has circumvented that and they get to the children before the family get to them. I'm going to tell you the solution in a minute. And so we, that's number one. We got to take all these together. That's number one. Number two is that we got to pray. We got to pray. You see what happened in Naaman and the claimants have hijacked prayer. They have made prayer a selfish exercise of, it's an exercise of selfishness and greed. It's God, what can you do for me today? God has already done that. Everything that we need for life was worked out at the cross. That's what Jesus meant when he said it's finished. The remnant for sin has been satisfied. God has accepted his offering. Jesus came into the world to save sinners and to be the solution to sin in the world. Prayer, what is prayer? Prayer then is listening to God. In addition to everything you believe about prayer, I'm not substituting something else, I'm telling you what it is. Those other things that you believe in, they might be helpful. <laughs> but prayer, Prayer is listening to God. Who is the person of prayer in the Bible? You know, it's Elijah. Elijah is a person of prayer. God told him something and he heard it and believed it. And when you're facing the crisis of his life and there, uh, and when he had obeyed God fully, he found himself running from Jezebel on the mountain and he wanted to hear from God. What is next? What is next, God? I've done everything you told me to do. What is next? He's going to get his answer because he shut up in that cave and a lot of noise is going to take place. The wind's going to blow. God wasn't speaking through that. But the Bible said in a quiet voice as he listened, God told him what to do. He said, you've obeyed me perfectly, and I've got a few things I want you to do, then I'm going to bring you home to be with me. Be with me. Prayer is listening to God. Prayer is listening to God so that we can know his will. Prayer is a preparation for our action. When God wants us to act, he wants to pray first. He wants to pray all the time. But prayer is listen to him so that you can know the will of God. The will of God is everything. John Perkins' will is not, is corrupt. John Perkins' will would be selfish. John Perkins' will would end up being for my own gratification. But God's will is pure and holy and is for society. And that's why he wants a group of people praying that his will would be done, that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. And so prayer, we got the de-hijack prayer from the greedy naming and claiming, from looking for a blessing for themselves. I've been blessed. You have been blessed. All the blessing that we need for human life has been accomplished at the cross. What we need to do is access that and act upon that and believe that and obey that. And God action comes to us out of our obedience. So we got that, number two. That's what we got to get back to, is prayer. Number three, we got to decolonize the gospel. 
The gospel has been colonized. The gospel has been, you might say, hijacked to our own selfish concern. What is the gospel? The gospel is the love of God demonstrated. At the, yeah, John 3.16 is right. The gospel is in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is going Somebody going to say, God sent people to hell. God don't send no people to hell. I, I believe there is a hell. But God don't send you there. Because he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because they believe not on the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world, and people love darkness rather than light. People go to hell because the God of this world has blinded their mind, lest the light of God should shine to them hard. God has done all that he can do for humanity. It is our move. It is Amu. He left us here to carry forth this light, to be the steward of this light. He has given this responsibility and this wonderful stewardship to us as his replacement here on earth. And he's given us the Holy Spirit in order to empower us to do it. He hasn't told us to do something that he can't implement in our life. And so we got to de hijack prayer. Uh, we got to, I mean, the gospel. We, when we preach the gospel based on our race, all we do is colonize people. Uh, people don't believe that the gospel is the greatest power on earth. What is the gospel? The gospel is the love of God. That's the greatest power in all the world, is love. And so we got to decolonize it. Decolonize it. We've got to take all these restraints off of it. If somebody wrote a book a long time ago, we've got to unchain, uh, unhinder the gospel and share that gospel that has its own power in it. That's what pa Paul said. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The biblical teaching is whoever preached the gospel, whether they're saved, unsaved, they preach the gospel, the gospel still has an effect. Don't you remember in the Bible when John and them was walking with Jesus? And when did Jesus sent them out to perform miracles? And they met other folks out there performing miracles that hadn't been with them. And you remember John and them said, let's bring down fire from heaven and consume those people. He says, don't worry if they're not against us, they're on our side. Don't do that. And Paul said, there are some people who were preaching the gospel in order to get mess them up. Paul said, let them alone. Nevertheless, the gospel is being preached because the gospel has its power in it. And that's the power we got to release in the world. And they got to hear it and see it in our life. We got to become the kind of change that we are telling other people to God can do in them. We got to represent that in life. And so we got to Hold this gospel truth. This is our mission. This is our mission to all races. And this can reconcile people to God and to each other and make us sisters and brothers here on earth, here on earth, to do God's will in our society. Number four, we got to bring the church back to its proper place. All the good things that we are doing, if those good things are not enhancing the church, it's a side show. It's a side show. You know, I'm a parachurch guru. If there are parachurch guru in America, I would claim to be that. I have helped to create more parachurch organizations probably than anybody on earth. 
But if those prayer churches don't see their main mission is rescuing, going to places that the church is reluctant to go to, doing those things that the church won't do, but doing them in order that these people might become a part of the body of Christ. I love parachurches because they can move on out and do it. The real church will get a committee. <laughs> they won't move with no sense of excitement. But the parachurch, but that parachurch has got to represent the real church. And we ought to set up standards for that parachurch equal to the standard that we set up for the church because these sins are just as effective with those inside of the church and outside of the church. And so we are here for the church. I like that verse. We used it yesterday. Upon this rock, Christ, solid rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We need your church. The church is here to nurture the saints for the work of the ministry. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and the scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished to do the good work here on earth. And so our prayer church out there is representing the church. We should be getting 80% of our support should be coming from the church itself. The missionaries that go out ought to be supported by the church itself. And what makes the prayer church more effective, the prayer church is really working on some particular issue, and that's wonderful. And let's get the bigger society to work with us in that. And the bigger society will work with them. Anybody got a parachurch organization, they know there's businessmen and other folks who see these issues. And my Jewish people help me. They help me. They, 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 they will, well, I get resources to carry out my work from whoever will give the resource because the resources don't belong to us. And they don't belong many times to the greedy people that have it all. The resources belong to God. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and all that dwell in, the silver, the gold, all of this belong to God. And so let's use God's resources to accomplish God's objective here on earth. That's what makes the parachurch effective because it gathers the people in the city, in the, in the community that has a... Con Children who are not Christians need almost a better opportunity to access to education, especially if somehow we can put God and his gospel involved in that. And right now, I get invitations to come to public school. Oh, they, get, they bring the classes together. I go to the schools in Jackson where they bring the third grade, fourth grade together and sit them all around and put me a chair in the midst of them for me to tell them Bible stories and to tell my story. I heard these foolish, uninformed people saying, God has been pushed out of public school. How can you push God out of his creation? God is not just necessarily dwelling in those buildings. God is dwelling in you and me. They would have to kill all of us. But that's foolish talk. That's fear-mongering. That's fear-mongering to people. Giving people the idea every week, all the time. As soon as I get this last weekend, I was with the superintendent and all these people from colleges and universities talking about how can we bring more virtues back to the school. And they are talking about all this social program, this program, and this kind of program. And I say, you bring them. All morality in the world is based on people's religion. Did you know that? Yes. And our religion is our faith in Jesus Christ. You can't stop that. The gates of hell can't prevail against that because he placed his treasure in these earthen vessels. This church went forward when those martyrs was killed. Missionary activity in America, I can remember it. I was just being saved. When those five guys went down into Latin America, Jim Ellis and all those guys was killed. 
And I read his poem before he went in there. One is no fool to give up that which you cannot keep to gain that which you cannot lose. I'm telling you, we don't need to be fearful. We need to care God. We need to be redemptive. We need to find ways to be redemptive in every area of society. They invite me to come to lawyers' associations and all these associations. All of the law in the Western world is based on Moses. It's based on Moses. He was a pattern of law. You get the idea? And so we Christians is, 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 is fearful. And just tell me something to be fearful of. And that would be an excuse for me not to obey God. Fear is to be managed with courage. Fear is to be managed with courage. Courage to obey God, to do what God has called us to do. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? What is the last one? The last one is that you've got to have a, a philosophy of ministry. If you get your philosophy wrong, you won't achieve nothing. The philosophy of life is the organized principles by which you do things. A philosophy of life is like when you buy a watch or anything that you got to put back together to make it work. It has five things that you do. It says you do this, you open the box. Say this when you plug in this. You do this, do that. You do that. Now, you, us men, don't, we, don't, we leave that aside. <laughs> and we get it, and we get it all ready, and it don't work. And then what we say to the wife, I say to Vera May, honey, was there a little uh, instruction in that box? <laughs> and she will give me the instruction, and it'll say, do this, do this, and do that. And I go to the instruction, I do this, do that, do that. The clock runs. It runs. And so a philosophy of life is the way you organize thought for action so you can accomplish something. The Christian community development philosophy is what we call the three R's of development. We have now enlarged that to the seven basic principles, eight basic principles of Christian community development. What are the three R's? To do effective Christian community development, you need to become one incarnated with that community. That's relocation. Go live in that neighborhood of that community. Or create your philosophy to raise up indigenous leaders. You don't have to go there. But now you can help, but the real leader has got to come from the neighborhood because that's inherited in the Great Commission. He told us to go into all the world and, pre and develop community, develop neighborhood, develop local churches within those neighborhoods to be the light, salt in that neighborhood. So relocation, first principle. When I talk to people, they do I have to relocate? Not to help me, you don't. You can just send me your money anywhere. No, but if you want to raise up indigenous leaders, you got to touch them. You got to touch them. And you can't touch them in no letter. You got to touch them. You got to touch them. That's important. So relocation, living in that community, living in that community, join with others to go in that community, support those people who relocate in those communities. Raise up indigenous people from that community. The second hour is reconciliation. We're going there with the whole idea of the gospel, breaking down these racial, cultural, and economic barriers and making us one. We got to believe that deeply. And we can't overcompromise that. You're going to come up with some kind of homogeneous thing, and all you're going to do is create some more racism within the community. What is the third one? The third one is redistribution. You got to know who owns the earth. I know, y'all think what I'm talking about, taking all the money from the rich and giving it to the poor, that would be about the simplest, stupidest thing you do because the rich would have it back tomorrow night because they have the means of production. All they have to do is raise their prices a little bit and get that money back. So I'm talking about something more creative than that. I'm talking about how do we put the will 
and the energy and the creativity into the lives of the people in the community? And how can we help them to get the pleasure out of providing some goods and services in those neighborhoods? How can we create work in those neighborhoods? Because the best welfare program in the world is a good job. So if you're helping people to be successful, let me conclude here. I got time. I'm doing pretty good. I got time. So you, you got the philosophy. You got the philosophy. What can the righteous do? Let me tell you. I'm passionate with this. I've been looking for a curriculum to circumvent the media, to get the Word of God into the families. In Jackson, uh, something that's fantastic has happened. I'm working with one church in Jackson, and we have a weekend retreat once a month. We're trying to have it with 20 men, in particular, 20 black men, because that's where our critical issue is at. They are filling the jails, and they are not taking care of their children. And our young girls who get a college education can't find no husband. Critical issue in the community. We found a curriculum, a children's Bible. I am committing my resources, right? Viermay's resources. We are getting ready to, we old enough, we got enough to last us now. We, we can survive. We can survive. We, I'm 80, she's 77. Uh, we can survive. We can survive here. Now, what we want to do, we want to start a movement similar to the Gideon. But it's going to go for the home. What they did here at this hotel here, y'all didn't find no Bible in y'all room, did you? You know that's a shame. You know why? They know that the Christians take all the Bibles with them when they leave. <laughs> Isn't that a shame? And so they did not want 3,000 Bibles to go out at one time, and so they didn't put none in the room. Well, we're going to do like Gideon. My goal, is, listen to this, my goal is to get this most beautiful book. We got a company that is producing these for us, specially for us. It is neutral on race. Because we get it, a black person get it, and they'll say, oh, that's a white man. They done pressed us long enough. I can't read that thing. And, and, a, and, 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 and a white person get it, they're going to say, we don't want our children looking at all this black stuff. Because we know God is white. <laughs> and so I said, make this thing neutral. Make it a little bit brown. Make it a little bit muscle culture in line. Shade it a little bit. And this, I used it this summer. This is what I used this summer. All of the Bible stories, and it's written for parents, for grandparents. I know the power of it. It's written on a third grade level. So that, and I'm doing this, I want prisoners to get it. I want them when they come out of prison to get it, read it to their children. We got to transfer that faith early on in the home. And what I want us to do, and I, we have never asked CCDA to do something like this, but I'm thinking to do now, first time. I want y'all to join with us in getting this Bible into the home. I want to get into the home. I want to get into prison. I want to get into juvenile halls. I want to get into Christian school. In fact, I'm going to get this in Mississippi in my public school. 
because I'm going to give it to the library. I'm going to give it to the library, and I'm going to have a big news conference and say, I'll, I'll give my other 12 books together at the same time. You get there, and then I have this one mixed in there with it. <laughs> you get the idea? And, 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 and this is a gift. We'll have the newspaper there, have the pre television there, and look at good old Reverend Perkins. <laughs> what we want y'all to do, after this meeting is over, we got 500 of them here. We want you to buy them all, okay? Buy them all. But that is the beginning. Get back in touch with me. We get in touch with y'all. And we want to supply these for you. Y'all going to have to pay for these books. <laughs> because, but you're only going to pay enough to keep the system going. Keep the system going. We want to keep the system going. There are some people who are giving us a little money to help do this. And so that means that we can keep stocking. We can keep stocking. The, 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 and so we can get these, but y'all want to look at it, y'all want to take them home with you when, when you when you go. I think, that, and the pictures are so beautiful, and it's, a, it's 104 stories that ties the Bible from creation to the heavenly city in Revelation. And we can get, because the, while this young generation is developing with all of this social concern, they are missing the foundation of life. And the foundation of life is the rock of Christ. It is God on the rock. And this is what we need in all of our ministries. Because what is the ministry? We should be trying to get this by. So y'all going to be in touch with me. I'm going to sell them to you at a discount, not sell them to you. They're going to all be for a donation. We don't want to threaten our tax exempt thing. <laughs> So all the books are going to be for a donation, and you make that donation. Our time is, is, is gone. There's one other little thing I want you to do. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to push this thing. Uh, Wayne Garden has developed what I think is going to be a masterpiece. Who is my neighbor? Who are my neighbors? I think we need to know that. Know that. And so we, we're going to push that book tomorrow morning. For all of you. But this morning, this morning, I want those 500 books. They're right outside of the wall there. I want you to get them. And if you don't make it, they might be gone by the time you get there. Uh, but, if, but, but if you don't make it, get in touch with me. And what I want y'all to do is to market these back into your town. And you need to get in touch with me. And then I'm going to make you a prize that you can... Uh, Distribute these books into the hearts and into the lives of people. The Word of God. Let's pray. Our time is gone. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundation, the real foundation, is the rock Christ Jesus. And young folks need to know about that rock. And we got to get that rock into their hand. We got to get the grandfathers and grandmothers reading these stories to their children. We used to pass it on around the dining room table. Poor kids don't have no dining room table. Poor kids don't sit down and eat as a family. They eat on their way to school. I see them on their way to school eating. They feed them at the school when they get there. Ain't no Bible there. Ain't no great conversation there. You get the idea? We have got to enter the, get this Word of God because it's, that is where life is at. Life is tied up in the Word of God, and the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. So we got to get it there, y'all. Let's CCDA do it there. We're going to put them everywhere we can put them. I want you to write to me, and I'll send them directly to the people you write to me for. You write and tell me you want to send them to prison, to your children in prison. Send them, get them as birthday presents. Get them as Christmas gifts for the children. Get them, get them, and make them available to your children and to your uh, adult children so they can read this to their children. 
Father, thank you for this morning. And Lord, we just pray that you would lead us and that you would guide us as a movement, that we would be building on a solid foundation on your word. And nobody will ever say that CCDA have become some kind of liberal, unthoughtful, political front for some right-wing or left-wing politician that CCDA will be committed to you and committed to the neighborhood and committed to the children. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Right outside the door, the Bibles are there. Y'all get them, you better make her. Right.